you're listening to the Cut to the Race podcast. It's lights out, and away we go. Hello and welcome to the Cut to the Race podcast. Uh, today, Grace is with me and a special guest. Now, we've at this time of recording, we've just watched the Imola qualifying. It is literally just finished. And um, to join us is Jan Magnussen. How are you? I'm fine. Brave, actually. What a qualifying. Absolutely brilliant qualifying. And obviously that was K-Mag's second. Well, it was it was equaled his best um, qualifying result, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. P4. Pretty fantastic. Absolutely wicked result. Now, um, for people who might not know about you, do you want to just uh, explain yourself, what, what you've done in your career briefly for us? Sure. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I'm, uh, my name is Jan Magnussen, uh, ex F1 racer, Kevin's dad, and uh, proud, proud dad. Uh, in racing, I've pretty much done, driven everything from uh, all the junior Formula E's to through uh, DTM to Formula One to IndyCars to NASCAR, uh, touring cars, uh, Super V8s, trucks. Everything, yeah. <laughs> so, I've uh, spent the last uh, from 2004 to 2019. I was with Corvette Racing uh, in uh, IMSA and at Le Mans. Uh, so I spent a, uh, a lot of years over there racing, endurance racing, and really loving that. Uh, while following Kevin, Kevin, and seeing him grow up and go to Formula One and uh, go out of Formula One and back in Formula One and out of Formula One and back in. Uh, it's been fantastic. So, how, how did you yourself get into motorsport? Obviously, uh, Ke Kevin's followed you, and, and I know he looks at yeah. you as a hero. But uh, how did you start, and how did you decide this is what you wanted to do? Uh, so, uh, so sort of my family, my dad, and my brothers were into motor racing. Uh, uh, my dad did some rallies and uh, stuff like that, some motorbike racing as well in the sixties. Um, my brothers and I got into uh, karting um, when I was about 10 years old in the mid 80s. Uh, and then it uh, kind of took off from there. My brother was my mechanic and uh, he, he's uh, almost 10 years older than me. So he could sort of take care of me and drive us around to the races. So, yeah, he ended up going to Italy for, uh, he was a professional karting mechanic for many years. Uh, him and I had a lot of success, uh, won uh, three world championships in go-karts, and, uh, and that sort of opened up the possibility for me to go to England to do Formula Fords, and uh, on the Opel Lotus, Formula 3, uh, a fantastic Formula 3 uh, season in 94, uh, with a lot of wins, and that got me into Formula 1. I was going to say, you had a pretty incredible Formula 3 career. Um, you beat Senna's record. Yeah. Was Formula 3 your favourite time in racing, or do you have another favourite era? I mean, the, obviously, Formula 3 was very special for me. Uh, I didn't know how uh, important that season was going to be uh, and how, uh, how much it affected the rest of my career. But obviously, I won 14 out of 18 races. And and all the it, it, I got into such a great rhythm where uh, I pretty well I pretty much knew I was going to win. <laughs> I just didn't know how, but uh, I knew I was going to win. The, winning that much, uh, and somehow it gave me an idea of well, I'm pretty sure my career is going to be like that for uh, always. But uh, after Formula Three, it got really difficult. <laughs> but uh, now it's fantastic. I actually just. Got, I just received that Formula 3 car back here in Denmark uh, last week. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's sitting in a, in a in a workshop with some buddies of mine, uh, taking good care of it. Uh, and that's, that, that's fun. And Kevin's really pushing for us to uh, to uh, to fix it up and go racing uh, or go and... Uh, oh, yes. Oh, that's uh, gorgeous. At least do a test or something. Go back to England where, where it raced and... Uh, uh, and, and and have some fun with it. So I'm uh, looking for an engine. So if you guys know anybody that has a Milton 
uh, from uh, from '94. I'm uh, I'm up for it. So <laughs> you're it. you're probably better connected than we are for that. But <laughs> so, that 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 car that you've just shown us that would that would live in my front room if it was big enough. My front room that is <laughs> right next to the sofa where you can just look over and go yes yes good. Yeah. I was gonna say you could do what PK has done and just put it on a wall. Yeah. So uh, we're debating back and forth. I'm not winning this argument with my wife, but uh, so, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. We'll find a cool spot for it. But definitely get it running, go drive it, feel it again, and, uh, and maybe there's my historics in it. Mm. But uh, I want to be careful. There's not that many parts, uh, you know, if we crash it. Yes. So, but Kevin wants to have a go in it as well, which is pretty cool. So that would be good to see. Um, I mean. You, obviously, we, we talk a lot about single seater racing, but you've and your success in Formula Three. You've done other series. What what are the differences? Where where, where was your love? Because you know, and NASCAR and and GT yeah. racing is very different. Where, where do you have the love and passion? So going to uh, going to race in America was was uh, big for me. Uh, I felt at home there much more than I did in Europe for some reason. Uh, it's more somehow calm. I, ca I came out of Formula One in a bad way. I was fired from, from Stuart Grand Prix. So I wasn't, you know, uh, probably mentally as strong as uh, as you would hope after something like that. And uh, so coming to America and getting, uh, you know, feeling really part of a team and the team super happy f uh, to, to, to have me there. And uh, I was able to make a difference. Uh, the team was you know, started winning with this. I, I, I came and joined the panels, which was uh, uh, the guy that owned the series, uh, the American Le Mans series. And, uh, you know, just feeling part of that. Uh, the, 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 there's a different sort of approach to things in America uh, that, I, that I really love. It's the same thing I felt at Corvette Racing for all those years. It sort of becomes an extension of your family. and You spend a lot of time with, uh, time with those guys. Um, so, uh, I, I, I really love that. But I love all sorts of racing. The, the, the racing uh, is not, I mean, as, as long as it's at a high level and against some, 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 some good guys, then, then I love all racing. Uh, but, it's, but the racing part is such a small part of it. Uh, it's, the, it's the life around it that makes the whole difference for, the whole difference for me. And America is really good for that. Speaking of America, I read somewhere when you did your NASCAR series that one of the races was a, like a three-hour bar fight. Is that right? Tell us the story <laughs> behind that. That was uh, that was my uh, my NASCAR race. I did some uh, development work for uh, for Hendrick Motorsports uh, for their road course car. Uh, so uh, at the end of that, they sort of awarded me with uh, with a race. So they, they, they put an extra car in at the Sonoma, at Sears Point in California. And uh, just to, to give me the experience and sort of uh, feel what I helped develop. And uh, that, I, it was such a crazy experience, the, with the, the NASCAR race. And they're tough guys. I mean, well, they're cowboys. And uh, they drive like that as well. <laughs> so it was uh, so much contact. Uh, little contact, not nothing crazy, uh, until the last twenty minutes, and it just goes completely crazy. Uh, so that was a just a three hours of surviving, and then uh, uh, trying not to to do anything stupid and piss anybody off. And then for the last twenty minutes, you you had to go for it. My spotter was on the radio the whole time, you know, saying that uh, uh, I needed to put my big boy pants on. <laughs> because now you gotta go <laughs> so but fantastic experience i would have loved to have done more nascar stuff but um uh, obviously that whole thing got going way too late in my career so sports cars was was the big thing for me did you find uh you know kevin kevin's called the bad boy of f1 did you find yourself turning into the bad boy of nascar during that period during no you really had to go for it no, no, no. So obviously, I, I just did one race uh, in 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 NASCAR. I did a bunch of testing and one race. Uh, but to be the the bad boy of NASCAR, man, you'd have to be pretty bad. <laughs> have to be a five hour bar fight like, rather than a three hour. One. So, <laughs> yeah. well, talking about you know hours uh, leads me nicely into um, the twenty four hours of Le Mans. What a segue yeah. that was! Brilliant, wasn't it? Um, yeah. 
Now, you've had four wins in series in the mark. Now, what? Yeah. what's it like? We've had other um, drivers on this podcast trying to explain it, but how, how awesome is that race? And, and yeah. what's it like to win in, in the series as well? Because that, that's, that's yeah. something, doing it four times, it's, it's not something everyone does. No, no, no. Obviously, I was very fortunate to be joining uh, Corvette Racing um, first in GT1 and then followed them, you know, as they moved out of GT1 into GT2 and GTE and whatever the hell they were called. Uh, um, but that is a, a world class organization. Uh, lots of people, lots of designers, engineers, uh, fantastic mechanics. It's a, that is, I would say, the, the, the place to be in GT racing. Uh, before that, I drove for Panos and I did one race uh, one year. Uh, at Le Mans with the Audi R8, which at the time was probably the, the, the best sports car ever, except that that was the year the Bentley arrived and, and beat everybody. <laughs> so, but um, I didn't have, I didn't reach the podium uh, uh, with, uh, with any of these cars, but it's when I joined Corvette Racing to do GT racing that we started winning. Uh, and that makes a big difference. Le Mans is a, is a tough, tough race. Uh, and there's so much work that goes into preparing yourself, preparing the team and the car uh, to, to, to be able to not only complete the, the, the distance, um, uh, but also be able to, to, to fight for the win. So to be able to stand on the podium there and looking over, I don't know if it's 100,000 people or what, that's standing down in front of the uh, podium is the most fantastic uh, feeling I've ever tried, uh, ever experienced. And uh, <clears throat> actually, one year, with, uh, one of the best experiences I've had on the podium was actually not win. One of the years we didn't win, we were leading on the last lap. We had a puncture, ended up finishing P3, and everybody's. It's fantastic reaching the podium, but when, if you think you're going to win, oh, to be honest, I was already thinking about what to say on the podium when, <laughs> when we punctured. So it was a little bit of a letdown. Uh, and then all the confusion, my uh, at that time, uh, uh, he must have been six years old. My my son Luca uh, followed me to the podium, but in the confusion, nobody from the team went. And there is a, a constructors' trophy as well. And we were up there waiting to go out on the uh, on the podium, and the, they didn't know what to do. There's nobody there from Corvette, and the the French guy controlling it all up on the on the podium said, "Well, Luca, my little boy had a Corvette shirt on, so he sent him out to get the." The uh, the constructors trophy, which was so cool, standing there with with Luca on the podium. <laughs> so. I've seen that picture. I've seen that picture. Yeah. The best family photo possibly ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was, and it, then it became okay. Everybody was pissed off about finishing P three, but then that, that made it all uh, very special. I was going to say, um, last year you had an all Danish racing team for Le Mans and you actually competed yeah. with Kevin. How was that? Was yeah. it was it smooth sailing or was there a no. bit of no <laughs> <laughs> No the, the the thought of it and the dream to do uh, Le Mans with Kevin uh, was there from uh, you know the dream was there for many years and the thought of doing it together was we had such high hopes. We had tested really well everything looked like shit, we, we might have a chance at this. Uh, and then we arrived at Le Mans and we, it was just one problem after another, after another, after another. And a, or we, we finished the race, but we were last of it with all, all the issues that we had, big crash in the middle of the night, punctures. Uh, it just, all the stuff that cannot happen at Le Mans happened to us. Uh, so not great, but fantastic to have, to, to have done that, gone through all that uh, uh, preparation and the, you know the, the the feeling of Le Mans with Kevin was. Uh, I'm so happy we got to do that in his off year, and then uh, I'm super happy I don't have to do that again. <laughs> yeah, because um, he sorry. was going to continue. Sorry, he was going to continue yeah. with endurance racing, wasn't he? Until he yes. got the call back and he just had to leave. Was it Peugeot? I think it was. Peugeot. Yeah, so he had a, a deal with Peugeot and a deal with uh, with Ganassi Racing in in the in the in IMSA in the in the US. Uh, but you know, up uh, like up until a week before Kevin actually said yes to going back to Formula One, he'd been pretty adamant that he was done with Formula One. Uh, you know, he, he had it out of his system. That was it. And when he got asked a lot, 
uh, whether or not he wanted to, to 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 join again, and you know he'd be slapping his thighs, laughing, saying, "Hell no, I'm done. I've done it." But uh, mm. I think it helped that actually he got the call, and he he wasn't chasing Formula One. It was actually Gunter Steiner that called him and asked for his help, uh, and it didn't take him long to to feel in his guts, you know, that I I, I have to do this. So, but it was a big flip flop for him from the, like, like I said, a week before, never again, he's done with Formula One. So, all right, I got to do this. <laughs> I mean, so, I, I guess you can understand that, right? Based on, well, from, yeah. from an outsider looking in, I could certainly understand why he would say that. But how much does sort of Kevin ask for, for your advice and your experience, even with on track at, at racing advice and, you know, even just big career decisions, you know, I mean, Kevin's yeah. been in and out and at the moment, you know, we're seeing the best for the last three you know races we've seen the best kevin we've seen in a long time because yeah. he's got the right equipment so how yeah. much does um your support help him yeah so <clears throat> obviously we we do discuss racing quite a lot uh his decision to to go back to formula one uh this time we did talk a lot about it but if I have to be completely honest, he made his mind up before calling me. <laughs> so, and that was pretty clear to me also when, because he was trying to be, uh, he was trying to reflect on what he was supposed to be doing, uh, the sort of career path that he thought he was going with sports cars and this and that. And uh, at one point, I, I, I asked him straight up, you know, I said, yeah, I, I know there are things to think about here. You have a family now. <clears throat> there's, there's, there's that aspect. So you have the other contracts. But I said, regardless, we're, we're, you know, you're going to say yes, aren't you? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> but I mean, he just needed to get the things out. He needed to to, to talk through the things. Um, there was a good feeling about the car, mm -hmm. that it could be good. Uh, but at that point, he didn't know. Um, then there was the whole thing about all right, so he missed part of the testing. Uh, so he'd be less well prepared than he could have been had he joined uh, three weeks earlier. But um, yeah, man, what a good decision it was. <laughs> you mentioned yeah. about him thinking about his family and everyone saw the gorgeous images of your new grandchild in the car. Yes. What, what would you think if she decided to join the grid in 20 years time? I would love that. Clearly got absolutely. it in the blood. Uh, absolutely, I would love that. Uh, Kevin's little brother, Luca, he's 12. He raises go-karts. And Kevin is having such a hard time loving it. <laughs> I don't know what it is that he... Uh, yeah. I mean, he goes, he follows Luca, you know, gives him, that, it gives, him a, it gives him advice and all that stuff. But he's so nervous for Luca. Uh, and he would be the same with Laura, I'm sure. Uh, but you know, I'm uh, you know, uh, I'm Kevin's father. I'm also Lucas's father. We have a I have a little daughter as well, Millie. Um, and it's it's not what you want as a father. It's what the kids want, and that's what you got to support and uh, and encourage. So I don't know if Laura, if Laura wants to race one day, I'm sure he'll let her. But. Uh, I, I think he hopes she doesn't. She doesn't want to do it. <laughs> It'll be nervous viewing for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk, it talking is, of it is, it is tough watching your kids race. Much, much harder than. I was, was going to say, you know, we we've. Uh, I, we, we, I sent a WhatsApp to you during the qualifying just then, arranging this. But what what are the nerves like watching your your children race and. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, how was how was you know when we when you came on the podcast, you had your hands in the air and you could tell <laughs> the emotion, and it's it's such a special thing. But um, <laughs> things don't always go to plan when you're racing, as we know. So, no, no, no. Um, how do you feel when you know those sort of things happen, and and how do you deal with it? Obviously, the successes are easy to deal with because it's just uh, pure joy. It's exactly. the disappointments, uh, the crashes, and stuff like that. That that's when it's uh, hard to to stand on the sidelines as a parent to one of the drivers. <clears throat> but you have to find room for it. You have to find a place for all that. Uh, uh, I'm not I'm not the one doing it. Kevin's the one doing it. He, he, he's the one in charge of, of all that. But obviously, you don't like to see anybody get hurt. Uh, but most of what I get most nervous about is uh, 
when I can when I can feel that he's that he might not achieve his goals or his dreams. Uh, that 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 that's hard to to deal with because you don't really know how to help. Um, so, uh, but like I said, I mean this this season so far has been quite a lot easier because the successes have been in within reach, uh, and he's been able to make the difference. And, and like you said a bit before, the, the version of Kevin that we're seeing right now is probably the best he's ever been. And uh, who knew that all it took was to remove Formula One from from his life and, and you know get rid of it and bring it back at a good time. I, th- I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I've I've always seen Kevin uh, as as one of the stronger drivers. Um, a lot of you know he's got a huge amount of fans. But it, it, yeah. it, when when we saw the, at the beginning of this season him fighting with Lewis and coming out on top, yeah. that's when I suddenly thought, damn, wow, this is yeah. th- this is when you can really see talent when you've got the equipment yeah. and. And they were pretty even in terms of the car they were driving from, you know, where we were sitting. And it was just <laughs> wonderful to watch. And, yeah. and it doesn't get any better than that, does it? No, no. But he's hard. I mean, I would. Uh, he, he he fights for every position, uh, regardless where he is and regardless against who, uh, who whom he's racing it. So I I, I I love to see that. I think most people love to see a guy just go for it whenever he gets a chance. So... And, and now he has a good car, so now he can actually go for something, which is fantastic. Completely off topic, but it's kind of on the same topic as being being an F1 dad, but having raced in F1 yourself, you were racing at a similar time to Michael Schumacher and Jos Verstappen. Is yeah. it weird to see all your kids <laughs> on the grid? And even that like is pretty special. Teammates. Yeah, that's, that's very special. Kevin called me... Uh, uh, at you know one or two races ago, where where, where they had been sitting together, those three, uh, and and talked about exactly that, uh, how cool it was that they're all their three dads uh, raced at the same time, and uh, yeah, it is pretty special. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I'll, obviously, uh, if if Michael could have. Uh, experienced it as well it would have been it was fantastic that's so tragic uh, that, that that he can't but uh, so i haven't met mick yet uh, but according to kevin he is a fantastic kid uh, and uh, he loves to work with him so uh, they were, they were, they were, yeah it's tragic that michael can't uh, experience that but, uh, yeah fantastic kid having been you know quite closely involved in sort of the 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 uh, two eras of F1, let's say. Um, how how would you say the the sports developed? And and obviously you've raced against some of the greatest drivers on earth in your career yourself. Um, h- how has F1 developed as a sport? And what would you say sort of the key changes are since since you were driving? Obviously, <clears throat> so it's grown a lot in the last few years. Uh, the it reaches. So many, so many people compared to when I raced. It was, it was huge when I raced, but nothing compared to what it is now. I don't believe <clears throat> uh, reaches uh, uh, reaches a much bigger audience, uh, much more races, or uh, at uh, you know further around the world, if you can say uh, if you can say it like that. The cars are much more sophisticated than when I drove. Um, having a steering wheel like they have today would have completely done my head in. <laughs> so I don't have the capacity for that. But uh, well, that's what the young kids have. Uh, but they've, they've they've been schooled with that from uh, through simulators and stuff like that. Mm. I remember in actually my Formula Three car was the first car I had with a button on the steering wheel for the radio. Yeah, and it pissed me off that uh, it was there. It's just, <laughs> just more for me to deal with. Was it yeah. just one button? There's actually two. There was a uh, push to pass, which I didn't mind that, but the radio <laughs> was. Uh, <laughs> so, but there was a radio as well, and I had to talk to people and you know, make decisions. I didn't like. But um, the tracks are very different. Uh, mm. To the point where some of them are a bit boring. I'd love to see like Imola today. What a great place. There's yeah. a bit more runoff area than when I raced there, but it but it's still there's consequence. Um, but but some of the modern tracks are a little yeah. 
but uh, I think that's uh, all the drivers think that actually that, that, that they like places, old school places like Imola Spa uh, and stuff. Uh, I think everybody was pretty uh, surprised of how fast a street circuit can be uh, in Jeddah, uh, which actually that there, there I was nervous for, but <laughs> with, uh, it doesn't take a lot to have a huge a uh, huge accident place like that make sure that uh, oh, yeah luckily exactly. you walked away feeling fine would you have been wanting to race at Jeddah, or was that one time you'd be like no no i think the experience of running there would have been absolutely fantastic um street circuits are fantastic street circuits are my favorite guy, kind of race tracks. Uh, but go you, you see the onboards uh from the helmet cams and stuff like that how much and how fast how fast they're going and how much they're doing going that fast uh, man if i wasn't already a fan <laughs> well exactly you know and, and and i think you know the the technology like you've said we've now got these helmet cams that can take yeah. fans into what we could never see before and for me i find that that so exciting but yeah. you just touched on imola and runoff areas and i know we spoke before the show so i just have to ask um kevin obviously in, in q3 very nearly touched the barrier um, <laughs> did you was it you who taught him this little trick when he's spinning to keep the wheels going through the gravel can you cl take the claim to that because that was incredible wasn't it yeah i'd love to take credit for that but uh <laughs> he's gone through the gravel enough to know what to do <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I was uh proud that even you know spinning and how quickly he realized you know i gotta keep this going but he was also going towards the wall uh so uh now he got himself out of that uh, really, really well. That, was, that, that could have been a super embarrassing mistake, uh, but uh, the way he handled it, getting back on the power, and you can see wheel spin pushing it through towards the wall, stopping it before the wall, and then get getting uh, reversing a little bit back into the gravel, and then going again. That was, that was really well done. I think it was the perfect example of just trying everything until you're out for the count, because yeah. lots of other drivers would have just. Been like oh well that's my qualifying over but then yeah. he goes on and gets p4 his best yeah. ever like yeah that, was that cool. must have been oh so so nice to see he just keeps going uh, but also through you know spinning that uh, how how long he goes before he gives up uh, it's fantastic right you mentioned tracks new tracks that you weren't a fan of what yeah. is your favorite track you've ever raced at does it have to be formula one it can be sports cars what's your favorite yeah. track um uh, it is the old school type tracks obviously spa is a fantastic place uh but if i just uh, it's more a type of track that i like i like the north american tracks because they are all very very old school and they are also old, very old tracks but uh, places like watkins Glen, mossport uh road america which is very close to which is very similar to uh, to spa uh, Bathurst in Australia. I went there and did supercuts, a uh, super V8. I love uh, that track as well. I, I Bathurst really is, that, uh, yeah. is a fantastic place. Um, yeah, but it's it, it's that type of tracks. So it's hard for me to pick up one that's that is the because the, the the usually if a driver have one circuit, it, most of the time ties together with where he's had a lot of success. So, but the actual feeling of of driving is that sort of that type of track where it's flowing, it's fast, there's consequence. Yeah. Okay, so we, we've said tracks. Let's go on to another quick one, which is cars. So you've driven, as you've said, pretty much all of them. Um, yeah. Which race car have you really connected with and felt you know your absolute best? And then which road car? You know, what's what's on your driveway? <laughs> well, I'll start with the road cars. So in my driveway, there's Cupras, uh, nice. and that's from my touring car stuff. Uh, I'm Cooper ambassador here in Denmark. Uh, I don't know what, what else. Would, so two kids, two dogs, two cats, toys, everything. So it's, uh, you know, big family cars is my favorite yep. to, 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 to fit everything. Um, favorite race car, was that the other? <laughs> Question. Yes, it was, yeah. Or uh, the car connected the most with. Obviously, driving, a, uh, when you get, the more miles you get in a race car, you feel much much more connected to it. And the Corvette race cars we had 
a lot of testing. There was it wasn't a new car every year. It was sort of a de development of a car over three or four years. So you got to know that car super super well. And I'd have to say the Corvettes that I drove were, was the car that I felt most connected with. Um, it's not the fastest race car, uh, but it was the fastest in GT. Um, in my so the fastest car I drove was my Formula One car for sure. Uh, even though I didn't get my, the most out of it, but uh, you know, drive back back then uh, with the Stuart uh, uh, Stuart Ford cars, the, the reliability was super bad. The engines were blowing up, and gearboxes. And I made some mistakes near the Formula One, so I never got the laps in. And, and when I finally got fired, was just at the time where I actually felt. Should now I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, so I talked about the, uh, the benefit of that. Uh, I, uh, but I, I found that in America with other cars. But uh, I'd love to have done that, finished off that season because I, f I finally felt, shit, now, now I feel connected with the car. Uh, and that is so important with the Formula One cars that are so fast and so on edge. Okay, so we, we've got time for one more question. I'm going to squeeze it in. Now, this is a special question. I don't think oh. anyone would have asked you this one before, but um, we've asked all of our guests who have been on from Black Mylander to, to other, all sorts of people, and we yeah. always get a different answer. So we have a motorsport time machine here at the Formula Nerds, right? And we're going oh. to invite you into it. Um, in this time machine, you can go into the future. You can go, you can go back, and you can go anywhere for a moment or, or a race in the motorsport history um so you can be a driver you can spectate um any series where would you choose to go if you had one trip in our motorsport time machine i would go to a 1955 milli million and sit next to sterling moss uh, being the first guy to go have an average speed higher than 100 mile an hour for that whole race and again, we've had another cracking answer. That is fantastic. That's brilliant. <laughs> yes, that is a good one. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming on to our show. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, Thank you. Do you think Kevin's going to make a podium this uh, this year? Do you think he's got it in him? Uh, he has it in him, <laughs> for sure. Man, I hope so. It would be so cool and such a great story to this whole uh, comeback of his. That uh, to, to get a podium this year, but uh, we'll see. He's in a great place now. The team's doing a fantastic job with what they have. Definitely uh, making the most of it. And they built a, a really good car over the winter. That's I think it's easy. None of that is easy, but it's probably easier to drive than some of the other cars. But, and that's uh, it's given the results right now. So uh, I hope so. You need you, you need to another podium. Well, he, he certainly deserves it, and I think the the whole the whole motorsport world are behind him. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely fantastic to see. So we will be watching and uh, hoping along with you. So um, thank, thank you, you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye bye. You're listening to the Cut to the Race podcast. It's lights out, and away we go.